welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight for another one of our Okanagan Print Triennial Artist Talk series. My name is Kelsey and I'm the Learning and Community Engagement Curator here at the Vernon Public Art Gallery. And as a cultural institution, I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge that I'm located on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Sealix people. I'd also like to give a big thank you to Alternatives Funeral and Cremation Services for supporting the Art Gallery and supporting our Artist Talk series. So tonight I am very happy to introduce to you Luke Johnson. So Luke Johnson is a Wisconsin born artist based in Edmonton, Alberta. So that's in Canada for those who are international. Um, he received his BFA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and his MFA from the University of Alberta. And he is currently a lecturer in, a, in, sorry, a lecturer in printmaking and the drawing department here in the University of Alberta. So his work has been shown throughout Canada and the USA as well as international print exhibits in Armenia, Australia, Finland, Poland, and Portugal. So a bit of housekeeping before we begin. This talk will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube page. So um, when Luke takes it away, I'm going to mute and shut off all your cameras if you don't do it for me first. And then when the Q&A period comes back up, you guys can either turn on your camera and your audio and ask Luke a question, or if you're uncomfortable, you can always leave it in the chat and I'm happy to relay it over. So without further ado, if you could give Luke a warm virtual welcome and um, we'll see you all soon. Thanks. Thanks, Kelsey, for that excellent introduction. Uh, and thank you all for being here. I know in this world where we're on Zoom so much that spending a little bit of your evening on it uh, might be difficult, but it's nice to have lots of people here and some familiar faces and lots of strangers. So. As I guess makes up for a world without art openings and things like that. So um, I guess I'll thank everyone at the Vernon Public Art Gallery and the people who organize the triennial every three years, uh, Briar and Lubos and everyone else. Uh, you know, I imagine that it's hard work in normal times and 10 times as much work now, uh, but I think it's been very exciting getting to watch some of the tapes of these talks to look at the art online and in the catalog and um, sort of find another way of continuing to engage with printmaking in this strange world that we find ourselves in. So uh, I'm going to sort of frame this talk, which is going to be in maybe three parts around the idea of the body in the library, because I am an artist who works a great deal with archives and collections like libraries. And uh, these collections are things that I engage with, not only as an artist, but in some ways as a volunteer librarian, and that this is a major portion of what I do, that I wear many hats in many different ways. If you're not familiar with uh, this image in front of you, this is one cover of Agatha Christie's The Body in the Library, which is a novel from, I believe, the 1940s. And this stars her Miss Marple, who is a elderly spinster detective. Um, Agatha Christie was very familiar, of course, with many of the tropes of detective fiction, which have permeated our culture. And uh, she frequently made use of these cliches to subvert them and draw the reader's attention to how common they might be. And so you are probably familiar with different bodies in different libraries through movies and TV shows, books, various stories like that. Uh, Agatha Christie in the introduction to this book says that in order to make her story different, that the library has to be uh, totally banal, a regular library, no secret passageways, no poison books. Uh, but on the other hand, that the person who ends up dead in the library must be terribly unexpected. This makes it a fairly unique book because most stories of bodies in libraries uh, feature a librarian who ends up at a horrible demise. And so regardless of the story, I'm going to read off a little bit of a quote from Grant Burns in his book, Librarians in Fiction, where he goes through over 300 examples at great length of librarians getting killed in different books, uh, noting that among other means of exit, they are shot, stabbed, strangled, beaten to death with books, rolled over by boulders and hurled down library stairs. If librarians serve as symbols of orderliness and the pre preservation of civilization, their frequent status as targets of fictional homicide 
may imply some thoughts about writers and readers desire to cast away the restraints of the civilization. What better way than to pummel the reference librarian with an encyclopedia? And so this uh, idea that it is not only people who die in libraries, but that this is a symbolic death, that it is a death of people who know too much and that it is putting at risk the knowledge that they have is something that is very interesting to me, not only in these detective stories, but uh, in my own artwork. I view myself in some ways as working along the lines of Christie, one of Christie's detectives, in this case, Miss Marple, as portrayed by Joan Hickson, who I believe is the only proper Miss Marple in a TV or movie adaptation. And uh, it's because she is an outsider that she can see things that the police do not. And so, uh, you know, that the police never allow her into the scene of the crime, but she sneaks her way in and through her life experience as elderly spinster from the village, not the city. Um, she's not trusted, but people will tell her things and she is always able to solve the crime and generally best the police. And this is something that I view myself as because I am not a librarian, because I'm not a detective. I am an artist. Perhaps uh, my artistic lens is allowing me to see things that these experts do not. And these are the things that form the sort of core of my artwork. I'm going to start with some of the work that I was doing at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and in particular, some of the work that came out of my time being an archivist and specifically a catalog assistant on a collection of works in the teaching collection specifically. And so this is one of these uh, wonderful things with thousands of prints that uh, students and teachers are able to handle. They're not behind glass. They are something that you can get up close and personal and have an excellent object lesson in the art of printmaking. And as I was going through these things, uh, yeah, stretch back to about 1930, all the way up to the present, again, thousands of works on paper. Uh, as I was removing a lot of them from the 50s and 60s from slightly uh, acidic, non-archival matting, I began to notice something that perhaps someone who sees these things in a museum behind the scenes every day uh, might not really pay much attention to, which were these kind of ghostly stains that were left behind by artwork within these mats. Somewhere between the acid in the paper of these mats and the oil of the prints, there is a chemical reaction that is kind of like, oh, a long exposure photograph, that this is a photograph with an exposure in the measure of decades rather than fractions of a second. And at the same time, it's very indistinct. Uh, you can't really make out the original image unless you're very up close and it feels like it's always right on the edge of disappearing. And so these things which are dangerous to the original prints, which are ostensibly the more valuable artifact, became of great interest to me and I started collecting them and trying to find a world in which they could tell some part of a story. That even though they might not tell you everything the artwork could, that through the things like the labels on the back, which might tell you what exhibitions these prints had traveled to, or more information, uh, what we might call in the library biz metadata about these artists, uh, that they were telling part of the story that was being removed, even if their removal was necessary in order to protect the art. And so in being this archivist, this started to change the way that I thought about my own artwork, which up until this point had been uh, mostly done through hand drawing and now was more engaging with physical objects and with photography in my prints. After I finished my undergraduate degree, I continued this outside of the institution, mostly through going to things like estate sales and yard sales and auctions, where I was looking at artworks and in particular uh, collections by people like myself in the middle class and the lower class, working class. Uh, so artwork that was you know, mass produced, often printmaking or um, offset lithography posters and things like this and in some cases, family photographs. And that these things, when they are lined up for the last time against the wall of a house that is being sold, are perhaps together as a collection for the last time. Uh, 
and that as they get sold and people decide that they're going to come back to pick them up later, that the sold paintings and prints would get flipped around. And so I was looking a lot at the backs of frames and taking photos of these and transforming the photos into photolithographs, and in this case, sort of combos of photolithography, Xerox, and hand coloring. And so these are very grayed out images. Uh, they're kind of transient. They have these little halos from uh, making these in my basement. And um, they have some combinations, for instance, in this case, between the images that you can see and that you can make out still and those that have been flipped over. And so there's the combination of seeing those kind of labels and things that might tell you something about the image on the other side, but it's also withholding part of that collection and recognizing that we can't fully understand the story of these objects that were in front of us. And also that because these are not sort of museum quality artworks, these are not things that you associate with a major collection and being preserved, that although they may have been common when I was looking at them, these kind of airbrushed paintings of cockatoos and leopards, and sort of exotic creatures, that these uh, paintings are you know, sort of at risk of disappearing and with it a sort of a whole story of how a class of people uh, aspired to own artwork and to engage with the world outside of their suburban lifestyle. And so uh, these are both memorials in some ways, but they are memorials that are unpacking why this loss is important, I hope. And uh, some of these also got turned into etchings. In this case, uh, one that includes a rather famous printmaker, Claire Romano. And uh, you can sort of see these x-rays of the collagraphs uh, sort of showing through the backs of the frames. But at the same time, they are being effaced, that it is hard to access them and certainly not in their original quality and detail. When I moved to the... Uh, when I moved to Edmonton, Alberta, here on Treaty 6 territory, a uh, place in Cree that would be called Miskusi Waskihikan, I hope I'm saying that correctly, and apologies if not, uh, to attend the University of Alberta, I moved here and spent all of my money moving and going to grad school. And so initially, I could not afford paper, I could not afford to go out to eat, I didn't know anybody here, it was a totally strange place. And so where did I take solace? Well, I went to the library and hoped to uh, engage with all of these books. And maybe if I got some reading done, uh, it would tell me what to do with my life and with my art. And uh, these are some shots of the inside of one of our university libraries and the book plates of their namesake, Alexander Cameron Rutherford, who his name is somehow involved in most of the libraries on our campus, as well as the book plate for our university. Um, I think the very first day that I went in and one of the very first books that I picked up in the art section of our library, I pulled out a bookmark that someone had left behind and I thought, well, that will probably come in handy. And so I pocketed it and kept going looking for my books and started noticing more and more all of the paper and bits of ephemera that people were leaving behind in them. And as someone who couldn't afford paper, I thought, well, perfect. Uh, it's, it's free, all the paper that I want that people are just leaving behind as litter in the stacks. I was also fortunate that undergraduate students are very wasteful with their paper, and so there were lots of little trimmings and offcuts from their prints that I could then uh, take the things that I was finding in the library, and I started making copies of them. So uh, these right here are all copies of things that I was finding in the library and are fairly typical examples. So you can see things that you maybe can tell are post-it notes and bits of scraps of colored construction paper, notes, old photographs, and then some things that are maybe a bit more uh, unusual. Uh, for instance, a love note in Turkish or a fax machine copy of Duchamp's large glass. Uh, uh, portraits of William Blake that were quite dog-eared. and. As I was making these copies, I initially didn't know exactly what I was going to do with them, but I knew that I wanted to uh, sort of give something back to the library if I was going to be taking so much material out of it. Uh, eventually, 
I decided that I would start stamping these with this little note of attention on the back that this item belongs to a specific AC Rutherford ephemera collection and that it would be cataloged by an assistant librarian named Luke Johnson. And that is a title which is very much self-appointed. The library did not know that I had decided to become one of them. And I began placing these prints back into books into, in the library. And instead of necessarily returning them to where I had found them, I wanted to place them in places where there was some uh, cohesion between the object that I had copied, the scrap of paper, and the spread in the books. And so that someone flipping through these, it's not just a bookmark, it's not just a bit of litter that on its own might not mean very much, but it is something a little more unusual that you realize, okay, this isn't what it appears to be. It's a print. It's only one-sided. It has this strange stamp. It has some vague connection maybe to the thing that I'm reading about, and yet I can't really trace it beyond that. You can't take these things to the reference library and ask, what is this collection? It's uh, something that is operating independent of the library, even though it's very deeply embedded within it. And then on the other hand, I took the original things that I was finding and began displaying these in uh, flat file drawers and was organizing them based on a fairly idiosyncratic set of standards for things that had uh, like content or histories. And uh, this is a, just a small sampling of the things that I found. I could fill uh, at least 20 of these drawers. I think uh, how most of these things are in a series of stacked bankers boxes in my closet. But I think when you see all of this together, it really reiterates that it's kind of a group portrait of everyone who has used this library. You become very aware of the fact that despite the, that they tell us that libraries are not being used anymore, that they are very active places. And even if maybe they are less active now in some ways than they were in the past, these objects come from all different periods of time. And so some things are left to sit for decades and decades without being touched. Other of these others uh, within these collections were things that I found a few days before and were maybe only a few days old themselves. And so I think that in the world that we live in right now, where I think I read that in the last 10 years, about 20% of libraries in the UK have closed, uh, where so many institutional libraries in the States are getting turned into maker spaces and public libraries are getting turned into computer cafes, that uh, this is a reminder that these are active spaces and that these spaces are important to the people who use them, even when they accidentally leave things behind. One summer, while I was uh, going back to Wisconsin from Edmonton to help a former professor of mine clear out his studio, I decided, I thought, well, if I'm going to the library every day in Edmonton, I could probably do this project wherever I am because there are libraries wherever I go. And when I arrived in Madison, Wisconsin, I have found out that very shortly before, the university had released a new plan which would close 22 of its libraries and centralize the remainders uh, in very large spaces that would have 85% of their books removed. And some of the libraries, by the time I got there, had already closed and had their books moved to offsite storage. And so as I was going through books and libraries that were closing, I realized that my engagement was going to be much different, that these were not things that I could copy and return, that they really had no home to return to, that these books were getting removed and that would, they would not be easily browsable. If you're not familiar with what offsite storage libraries look like, uh, they look something like this. This is the University of Alberta's. Uh, these are stacks that are something like 40 feet high, and they have these uh, incredible number of books that are not sorted by any system that any of us would understand. Uh, you cannot find something based on its subject or its author. Everything is sorted by size. So uh, when a book arrives here, it goes into a box with other books of the same size. Once the box is full, it gets put on the shelf with a barcode. 
And I went and visited this offsite storage with a few friends uh, from the art department. And we got to bothering the librarians and archivists here. Well, what happens if your computer system goes down? Is there a backup? No, there is not a backup. So uh, there is a great risk that things become basically irretrievably lost when we are reducing these systems, we are taking the people out of them, and we are turning these into data points somewhere, and they're totally abstract. We're sentencing these books to death, and these might be kind of a uh, book graveyard rather than a real library. Having experienced uh, at the University of Wisconsin that despite uh, the fact that they said they were not throwing out any books, but I found most of those notes and things in books in a dumpster behind a library. I thought I would start paying attention to the dumpsters behind libraries here in Edmonton. And uh, when I came back, I started looking around for books that I thought should be places and they weren't. Um, in one case, I was told to look at the work of a previous graduate student who had done their master's degree here. And uh, was told, well, there should be a thesis, a physical copy of all their work in 35 millimeter slide form with an artist statement that I could find. And I went to the library to ask about this and the librarian said, oh no, we got rid of those years ago. No one ever took them out. And well, that, that was very alarming. And well, where are they? What should, where, where can I find this one that I was told to look at? Well, don't worry, everything has been digitized, the librarian told me, so you can just Google it, and that's the best way to find them. So eventually I was able to find that most of these were being kept in a closet within the art building, a closet within a closet alongside all the Christmas decorations for the department, uh, but that many of them were already missing. And uh, so I was able to look at them, but I had this ability to because I was within this institution. It's not something that someone in the public would necessarily be able to find. And so I decided to take the librarian's advice and I would write down one piece of artwork from everyone's final show and I would Google it and see if I could find it. And finding that they were not digitized and that these uh, books were in a fairly perilous position, I decided the best way to present this would be to kind of recreate my Google searches. So each one of these little cards represents one person who has a master's degree from the University of Alberta between 1972 and 2015, uh, when they stopped taking physical copies of your thesis away. And uh, there's a few of them that you can maybe see are little colored blocks, and those represent copies that are entirely missing, either because someone forgot to turn them in or forgot to return them when they borrowed them, and in some cases because they were thrown away. To show you a sort of a close-up of how this works, this is one year's worth, where you can see I have searched for these titles, Chiara Scuro 3, A173, Alberta 71, Movable Image, and Max Millen. If that was meant to be Max Millen, the typo is the original artist, I just copy what I see. And uh, these are the images that Google returns and says, this is what you're looking for. And being able to see these slides for now, I know that this is not what I'm looking for. And it was only in two cases that I was actually able to find artwork by these artists based on my Google search terms, uh, both of them printmakers for what it's worth. Um, so Matthew Rangel was a lucky one who graduated in 2004 and one of Canada's uh, more notable contemporary artists, Janet Cardiff, who graduated from here in 1983, but uh, her work was subsequently pulled from Google at the copyright holder's request. So I replaced it in the final installation as well. I also went to other collections that were not maybe being uh, disposed of in whole or were sort of uh, singular in their weeded uh, qualities. So I started photographing books that I found in dumpsters that were getting weeded out of collections. That's the term that librarians use when they remove a book from the shelves. And I wanted to photograph them in a way that was uh, hopefully somewhat seductive, that it made them very impactful and that you thought, well, this is an image that is hopefully attractive and you want to open the book and you're unable to or if you're looking at a stack of images that you can only see little bits of labels and maybe can't identify what the original documents are, 
that uh, it makes you miss the original. Uh, as I kept making these, I thought, well, there is the risk perhaps that someone looking at this goes, well, this is a kind of a replacement. It is another one of these memorials that if we can't have the original, maybe these photos make up for that in some way that, well, you turned it into art. And so that makes it okay. So I decided to install some of these with the original objects, uh, books and recordings out of the dumpsters. And the, you have these original photographs, the original objects on shelves near the floor. And then you have these prints, which are large scale digital prints from high, very high resolution scans of the objects. They are printed at just about life size and they have uh, layers of offset printing to try and get their colors as correct to the original. I'm really trying my hardest to replace these things that are being lost. I'm trying to do my best to say, okay, if this is the best that I can do, if this is the most attractive I can make these things, if this is the closest to the original that I can bring you, um, what is still missing? When you have this awkward gap between what is this hopefully attractive, very rich image and these uh, physical objects below, uh, what, what is that gap? Where, where do you begin to miss these objects or think maybe something is being lost? Just to sort of focus on one to elaborate on that, this is an incomplete set of the complete works of Goethe. Uh, these were published in 1872 in Berlin, and they somehow ended up um, between that time and the present in Chicago, where they were sold to a group called the Germania Club, which was founded as a choral society to send off Abraham Lincoln's casket. And they were major, major players in the Chicago cultural scene for decades. They eventually disbanded. All of their things were sold at auction. This book somehow ended up in Alberta, where it was donated to the library of the Germanic uh, language department, which was eventually amalgamated. Its reading room was reduced and the books were given away, and some of them were thrown away. So what uh, in the story is uh, kind of irreplaceable? You know, on the one hand, Goethe is not an author that is uh, at risk of sinking into obscurity, um, but on the other hand, there's something very unique about the story of these books, and there is something like this lock of hair that has been preserved here, something that is totally mysterious. We don't know whose this is. I can't figure out why it is marking a set of poems that are poor translations of the Persian poet Hafez. Uh, it doesn't add up. And I hope that these things in some ways are like riddles that don't totally add up. And that because we have these questions at the end of the day, that there is something here that we are losing that we can't say, oh, these things exist in another form, and so it's okay to dispose of them. At the very least, maybe we'll ask a few more questions before we do. I got the chance to be maybe a slightly more official librarian on a collaboration I did with the artist Sahela Esfahani and sociologist Satoshi Ikeda uh, on a project called the Carbon Capture Library, where I was hired to be a librarian of a living library where people could come and they could get cuttings of plants and I would teach them as the librarian how to take care of these plants and their instructions beyond how to care with them were to take these cuttings, grow them and share them. And that through doing this, through learning how to take care of plants that uh, you are thinking more actively about your role in the ecological web as well as the role that plants might play in something like carbon capture or energy transition. Uh, this being part of a larger umbrella of projects called speculative energy futures. And these are sort of the humanity's response to uh, how are we going to transition our power away from petrochemicals and things which are actively destroying the earth uh, to ways that are far more just for all. And plants, I think, and we all think, hopefully, uh, play an active role in a better future for all of us. And as I was being the kind of librarian of this collection and getting to talk with people and people would bring in their own plants to trade in and hopefully those would go out into the world, um, I began to see more and more the sense that this ecological web is very similar 
to the web in which libraries play in you know, book libraries, uh, more traditional library or archive space. They're uh, one very important part of a much larger web. And when we think that these things can go away, that we risk that removing part of that web, we're not able to attach ourselves to others. We're not able to carry forward the stories that have been passed on for centuries or the learnings and teachings that we could have. And so uh, I think that this metaphor works in multiple ways and hopefully there is a very ecological connection and we can see our role as being one of stewards of the earth, but also all of the other webs that exist on this earth. And part of that is knowledge and maintaining knowledge so that we can have some understanding of what is true, what are the stories that we want to tell and how is it responsible to pass them on? What are we going to pass on? If you've uh, gotten a chance to see the prints that are in the Okanagan Print Triennial that I'm very happy to have alongside so many excellent artists, uh, you may be thinking, they don't quite look like what you've just shown. Uh, this is in part because a lot of my prints, I think, are kind of responses to all of these things that I'm kind of finding along the way that don't fit into these big installations that require a lot of time and a lot of research. Sometimes I'm finding something that just kind of uh, pricks me and I think, well, this is a really fascinating object and maybe it has a story that can't be elaborated on through a body of work that takes years and years, but I want to do it some justice and pay it some homage. And so I have this whole series of prints, uh, which I'm calling the incomplete history of communication, which are dealing with these kind of scraps, uh, particular things that I found in the library, whether they be literal scraps, things that were left behind in books, quotations out of books as I'm flipping through them. I have tens of thousands of photos in my iPhoto. It's kind of horrifying at moments and overwhelming. And uh, these things, as I go through them, I think, well, maybe I can turn a little bit of this into a print and present something that, while being a little more abstract than the work that I just showed, uh, is getting at some of the same themes. So this is, for instance, a print called Elephants Can Remember, which you may know is a nod to Agatha Christie, one of her later books. And this is taking scraps of a history of lithography, one of the media that I do and love the most, and uh, is using these scraps and their arrangement to uh, pick up on the idea that this is a fragmentary history and that I have these little pieces of a timeline they are not the entire timeline and that even when they were put together, it's not the whole story. So you're just getting a little piece of it, a little piece of a print from one of these eras. And in one case, maybe it's against a white background, like it's a specimen on display. On the other hand, it's against this bright orange background, which uh, for printmakers, you might associate with like blockout paper. And so it's a history that is being obscured. Or in this case, I'm taking a photograph from the Catalog for the Family of Man, a really pivotal exhibition in the history of photography from the middle of the last century. And the end papers portray these enormous crowd scenes, uh, you know, the literal family of man, so to speak. And the copy that I had found had a big tear through them. And thinking about this tear, and this uh, little piece that is missing from one copy of a mass produced book. And what could that kind of poetically mean if we reflect on this thing that we'd otherwise look over? And with a lot of these prints, they have fairly large colored sections that are seemingly empty. But I think in these pure colors and these large empty spaces that that's for me giving myself space to think at the very least that if I were to look at this photo alone, maybe I would understand it as sort of a formal thing that it's flipped on its side and there's this kind of cloud of torn paper. Uh, but then when it has this other space to think that I go back and forth between them and hopefully a viewer might sit there and try to tease out what those relations might be. This is another example of that series taking the back of a historical etching, which has some of these kind of burn-in marks, very much like those mats that I showed at the beginning, and is pairing it alongside 
a print of the bed of a Mylander offset press. And thinking about these ways that this press, which is kind of uh, at the end of its life, but is very much part of uh, the mass production of a kind of culture and was a very new and um, sophisticated technology in its time. And that now is this kind of artifact that just on its own produces this image, which is maybe reminiscent of the paintings of the same era in which it was made, that this looks kind of like an early Frank Stella or something. And that simultaneously this etching, which is coming through time uh, from a very different era, ends up having maybe some of the same feelings and forms as a Rothko, that uh, you're having these things that should not be making the marks that they are, and when they are posed against each other, maybe they make one of these riddles about why are these things connected? Why are these unseen sides of things always result in these kind of doom and gloom images of you know, the 1950s and 60s, or at least reminiscent of them? The two works that I have in the Okanagan Print Triennial are right here. Um, and these are smaller members of this same body of work. And so one being the, a consideration of the phenomenon of history and the other being what came out of the water. And so these are uh, slightly smaller combinations of lithography, relief, and in one case letterpress, the other case Xerox type. And so making use of text from uh, items I was taking out of the library, images that had attracted my attention, and posing them against each other without having a great deal of obvious connection between them. So for instance, in this case, having a recreation in handset lead type of the first page of the first edition of The Crying of Lot 49, which uh, by Thomas Pynchon, which is the story of a woman who is exposed to a bizarre system that may be entirely in her own head or may have been left behind by her dead ex-husband as sort of punishment for her. Um, and there's this constant teasing between uh, what is this system? Is it something that is real, that uh, she is being unveiled to the truth? Or is, it, is the truth really just paranoia? And in this case, by making it full of kind of errors that are being corrected. This looks maybe like for those of you who have done letterpress, like the sheet that you start off with that you might throw away afterwards that you've figured out where something's going to go and then you've decided and you run your edition that this is making those invisible choices about how to display something visible. And even though they may not totally add up, it is trying to get at this idea that this is a history that is in constant need of revision and that we have to be shifting it back and forth and editing it and that we should do so with some amount of care that what we do, all of these actions that might be invisible or feel very minor in the moment, add up and decide whether or not something in the future is legible or not, whether or not you can make out this text and find its source in the future is called into question. Um, changes in spelling and this little printer's devil here, a little raccoon that is assisting in the redistribution of the type, uh, all calling these events and actions into question. And then uh, what came out of the water is focusing in on a few different uh, uh, ecological themes for a portfolio I was in. And I was picking two species or varieties of species which are now extinct and are preserved in some way. Uh, in one case, the so-called Antarctic wolf, more popularly known perhaps as the Falkland Islands fox, uh, which is now extinct but was endemic to the Falkland Islands off the coast of Argentina and is preserved here in a taxidermied specimen and a photograph of that, which I found in a book. And then an extinct species is a variety of a domesticated flower species that was preserved in a historical autochrome photograph. And thinking about what are the things that survive and in what way they survive, perhaps they are only surviving as these kind of fragile documents, these photographs which are fading with exposure to light, these taxidermied examples, which we don't always uh, know are totally accurate. Uh, but we're trying to make the story out of what we have. 
uh, what remains. And so there's a, maybe a melancholy question about thinking about now with so many things disappearing so quickly, whether those be species of animals and plants. Uh, I'm of course very concerned with things like books that are disappearing and the sort of false promises of digitization that uh, these kind of little remnants that remain don't feel satisfactory. The taxidermied fox is not the same as a living fox, which is not the same as a thriving population of these foxes. And, you know, we're never able to smell these flowers. We're never able to uh, watch them grow and to take care of them and learn how they live. All we have is this kind of pixelated autochrome photograph. So I'll finish my portion, the kind of monologue bit of this by reading off the text, which from this print, which is from Miranda July's film, The Future. And uh, afterwards, I'd love to chat with some of you and if you have any questions. So, uh, quote, I mean, it's probably too late for all this anyway. You know how, like in cartoons, when the building gets hit by the wrecking ball, right before the building falls down, there's always this moment where it's perfectly still right before it collapses. We're in that moment. The wrecking ball has already hit all of this, and this is just the moment before it all falls down. That's just my gut feeling. I thought this was great, all of this. You know, the graphs, the people in the houses, the cars and the TV and the music. I loved this place. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Luke. That was great. Um, the floor is open. If anybody has any questions, now's your time. I have to say I'm very sad. <laughs> um, in our family, books are everything. My dad has a huge collection, huge collection of books. And um, it breaks my heart to, to see that, that we are lose, potentially losing so much and that um, in some people's minds, um, you know, uh, trying to document them in a different form is not adequate. And uh, so, so yeah, I'm finding this very, very interesting and, and very sad. <laughs> well, I'm sorry to make you sad <laughs> uh, on this Tuesday night. No, it, it's, it's just, um, it, it's something that I wish more people were aware of when, when people are so quick to say we don't need libraries and they're so quick to say they're not utilized by people and all of that. Um, they're not seeing this side of it. And, and so, it's, so it's a very interesting presentation. Thank you. Thank you for thinking about it. <laughs> Thank you for being sad. <laughs> I too feel sad. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm a bummer. Boy, go, go watch. There's a lot of excellent talks recorded already, and some of them are much funnier than this. <laughs> They're inspiring and invigorating. But no, I was wondering what can be done? I mean, this is, you know, a conversation aside from the works you have just presented us, but what can be done about this, this sort of wholesale destruction and, and uh, turning into virtual information of our world and the things that we love? Do we have a say in this or are we just going along for the ride, you know? Well, I like to think we have a say or if we're on the losing side of history that we're at least registering our discontent mm -hmm. in the things that we do. So. For I'm thinking about like that kind of gardening prompt that it's not all that different than having your own garden or a vegetable patch or something, but thinking actively about how do you disperse these things and tell other people to take care of them. These become very informal networks. You know, maybe the answer isn't going to realistically be reopen the libraries, make them what they were. Maybe it will be this very kind of hand-to-hand -hand passing off of these things. Right. Individual passions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like how um, in the work where you took those things that you were finding in the books and then put it in other books. And to me, it kind of seems like a little act of resistance almost to everything that you were talking about. Yeah, it hopefully slows someone down when they're looking. You know. I was 
I was also reminded of uh, in the film, The Planet of the Apes, when that cave was discovered that had the remnants of what the world was like before right. the apes took over. And it's rather like that, I think. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's something about the time capsule, you know, and this thought that we can preserve something and that it you know, stays in that cave forever in amber. It's, uh, it's very interesting, but who gets to discover it and what do they take? Because kind of an interesting question when there's that gap. So, so it is, you know, the big question across galleries, libraries, and museums. What do we collect and why do we collect it? And what is worthy of collecting? And um, that is the big question in Vernon that we're looking at as we're embarking on a new cultural facility. How much room do we need? And right. Why do we need it? And it has both the gallery and the museum looking at our collections and reevaluating and thinking into the future. And, but, it, but it's very much in line with, with some of what you're talking about. And, um, what's important to someone is not necessarily important to someone else. And, mm -hmm. Right. And we can't keep everything. And I, I recognize that, that that's not the way of the world. And it's, it doesn't make sense. We can't hold all of these things at equal value forever. It's, it's not fair to us. It's not fair to the future. And it's not fair to all of the other things that we could be collecting. So there is no easy answer, is there? <laughs> Well, you've made some interesting artwork to speak about that. And like you said too, it was like a, can't remember, maybe I'm remembering this wrong, but you mentioned that one of the artworks, it almost had like a riddle feel to it while you're trying to figure it out. And I find that the ones that you have in the art gallery right now are like that. I hear over here, cause they're kind of by my office. A lot of people being like, what is this and this? And how does this connect? And how is this narrative coming together? And it's an interesting way to keep people engaged and interested in the artwork, so. And um, on, on sort of a more superficial note, the, all those items together in, in one case look so beautiful. You know, the colors are so muted and the way they play off one another and the different proportions of rectangles and squares. Uh, it's almost as if it took care of itself, you know, colored decisions of color and decisions of proportion. Um, really beautiful, really aesthetically pleasing, regardless of the tender message that it conveys, you know, just as a, as a thing to look at, it's very, very nice. Yeah. Thank you. Very nice work. Yeah, I had a similar thought looking at your work again, Luke, that it's interesting how you use space in your prints. Yeah, well, I guess we never talked about that, did we? <laughs> <laughs> there are lots of other lot things to talk about. Yeah, a lot of empty space, right? Yeah, that's, well, there's that's... a lot of empty space in the world. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Luke, can you hear me? I can hear you, Liz. Yeah, well, no, I was just thinking, I mean, uh, I started out quite laughing at the beginning of your talk and by the end, yeah, it was, um, yeah, it's really touching and uh, disturbing at the same time. So I think there is there was some humor in, in the talk as well. But what I started to think about is how I've been going for walks a lot. I'm retired, I've got a dog, I go for walks a lot. And all over the community, there's more and more of these little, little libraries popping mm -hmm. up. And um, so I've been looking in them and you never know what you're gonna find. And it's, it's really interesting. It's a little bit, I suppose you could see it as a little bit of a subversion of this uh, destruction of libraries. Yeah. Uh, but I'm just wondering if young people are engaged with those little community uh, libraries that are going on. I mean, I think it's like a positive, positive thing that's happening. And then also at the Cross Cancer Institute, there's a great place to go and look at books and find stuff that you don't expect. So I wonder if maybe things um, more on the community level will start to kind of not, can, can never replace a library, 
but in a sense, it shows that there's care. Yes, there are signs of hope. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm right beside Liz here. Hi, Bernd. Hi. <laughs> but the whole idea of going into a library and, and looking for a book in particular and getting so sidetracked into, into many other books and yeah. the ones that you, most interesting ones were the ones that you weren't necessarily looking for and you, that's what gets you. So yeah. I'm waiting for them to open up those can stacks of all the books arranged by size. That'd be fun to go through there. You'll find Yeah, them. I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> I asked, they really don't want to. <laughs> they, don't, they don't let you in. No. No. But it does also kind of, kind of go to a kind of human quality of walking on the beach and just have looking, looking at stones and finding stones that you really like. So there's that whole idea of wandering that I think is really crucial to all of us and we can find it just about anywhere. So I think you sort of opened that up into a whole new kind of realm that was always in front of us. But I think it's something that I don't think will ever be lost either on a, on a, um, in terms of seeing or in terms of hearing. You pick up on things that have meaning. Yes. So thank Absolutely. you very much. Yeah. Great job. Fascinating as usual. Um, it looks, it yeah. Thank like you both. It looks like there's a couple of messages for you in the chat there. Thanks, Hi. All right. Would you like me to read them out or do you want to just read them yourself? Um, if you don't mind reading them, it's it's Perfect. nice to have a face to, to respond to. <laughs> Great. So oh. we have one from Alex Thompson. It says, Hi, Luke. Brianna here. I'm wondering how you feel about modified book art, where people cut up books or take off their covers for other uses. I once asked a librarian about them and she responded that they didn't bother her since she's interested in the information more than the object. Bear in mind, this was a survey of one. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I guess it depends. I, this may be uh, hypocritical. I don't mind a lot of modified book art but I generally see things that are fairly mass produced and um, there is something like it's a lot of folded paper and things where you can kind of piece together the original if you really wanted to out of that book. And so the book is passed on in some way. On the other hand, it's not in its original form. And so I don't entirely know. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a medium I choose to use, but I don't think it's inherently bad. Awesome, thanks. And we've got a comment from Briar Craig and he says, hi Luke, I love this work and love the honoring of lost or otherwise discarded overlooked artifacts. Thank you, Briar. And then we have a question. Oh, no, sorry, a comment from Sharon Ju. She says, beautiful and thought provoking work, Luke. Wonderful lecture, much food for thought. Thank you so much, I enjoyed your talk so much. Thank you, Sharon. And Thank you all for being here and spending a little bit of your Tuesday night. Yes, this is great. Thank you so much, Luke. We really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us tonight. Thank Hi. you. Hi, Marilyn. Are you, are you jumping in? I have in? a question. I have a quick, can, I, can I squeeze in one question? Oh, oh. So, um, who's the raccoon? And, what, and it was a nice surprise to see the raccoon in your print. Uh, it, the, the raccoon is a raccoon. Um, it's, it's an illustration out of a history book that I found and I thought it's from the era in which you were illustrating history rather than photographing artifacts and so I thought it was this kind of humorous little you know it was the artist's interpretation of something and they needed a raccoon washing its food in the corner of the drawing and I thought well that's the kind of piece of history that we're not <laughs> pulling forward maybe. Are you, are you the raccoon then? Well, I do wash my food, so <laughs> perhaps I am. <laughs> Thanks, Marilyn. Thanks for the talk, Luke. You have one more comment from um, Alex Thompson or Brianna. And she says, one more thought I had about those bookshelves that all have the blue spines. Similarly to your unarchival mats, it's an indication of the collection all on one shelf, all getting sun exposure. Yes. The sun is the enemy of us all. <laughs> <laughs> if 
Well, thanks so much, everybody. Um, this will be posted to our YouTube. So if you feel like you'd like to share this with anybody, it will be up there probably by the end of the day tomorrow. And uh, next week, a week from today, we have Yangbin Park coming up. So feel free to come on back for that as well. Good. Thanks, Luke. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Thanks. Have a good night. Okay.